Can you talk us through what a buffer zone is? So a buffer zone is an area around, in this case, a, a health setting that provides abortion services that would be free from protests to make sure that people accessing these services are free from the kinds of intimidation and harassment we've seen in recent years and escalating in recent years around healthcare settings, not just in Scotland, but in, in Northern Ireland and England and Wales as well. Several other countries across the world already have these in, in response to some of the behaviours that we're seeing here. And hopefully in not too long a time, Scotland will have passed this legislation and we'll see them in place. And so why do you think that buffer zones are so important? I think they're important because, we've, as I said, we've seen the rise in in behaviour, in, in the frequency of the behaviour and the number of people outside these settings and uh, an escalation in the types of behaviour we're seeing as well. Whereas previously there may have been people holding signs, giving out leaflets. We've seen at certain sites, certainly in Scotland, where some protesters were wearing body cams and using loud hailers, um, disrupting not only people on the street going about their business or people going in for appointments, but actually some of the services that were happening in the buildings themselves as well. Um, I know of cl rape counselling clinics, for example, who had that had to be moved to different parts of a building because you could hear the protesters inside. It's really important because of reproductive health and reproductive justice. It's a human right that you should be able to access your health services without fear of intimidation or harassment or in some of these settings being monitored going in and out. And for some people attending some of these services, that's that's one of the that's one of the biggest barriers for them is potentially being identified going to access these services. The vast majority of abortions now do not take place in clinical settings. So the people attending these services are often the most vulnerable, either with health complications, with language barriers, or other or other issues that would prevent them from being able to take um, the abortion pills at home. So for me, that's that's why these protests are probably I find them definitely <laughs> unacceptable because they are targeting the most the most vulnerable because we know those are the people who are having a, having to attend for for these services. Also in Scotland, it's slightly different to, to England and Wales and Northern Ireland where we already have this bill because often our abortion services are housed on multiple use hospital sites. Um, so often these buildings also house various gynaecology services, um, sexual health clinics, all these sorts of things. Um, so it's affecting quite a large, a large number of a large number of people if it's just that that's being housed there or in the bigger complexes like the Queen Elizabeth. Um, we know from clinicians there as well that some of these protests have been able to be heard within the neonatal intensive care unit. So the disruption for the wider hospital sites as well and the patients just wanting to access their health care is quite is quite vast. And so before we talk about the, the kind of legislation that you're proposing, um, I wanted to ask you about, I guess, the wider context in which this is taking place. So there was a lot of talk and reports early this year about um, anti-abortion activism being on the rise in the UK, particularly, I think, you know, after um, the overturning of Roe v. Wade in the US. And there was talk about, you know, uh, a lot of the tactics and activity from the US being imported to the UK um, in opposition to reproductive rights. How have you seen that play out in Scotland? Have you seen that that kind of significant rise over the last um, year or so? We've certainly seen the number of people turning up at things like 40 Days for Life Action um, increasing. We've seen um, people who are maybe higher up in those organisations uh, putting out comment on things that are happening in Scotland. A lot of that was targeted towards the former First Minister rather than myself. But there is always there is always a danger that the overturning of Roe versus Wade emboldens those in other countries who feel that their country should be next in, in repealing um, reproductive rights legislation or, or many other things as well as we're seeing. It's just a slippery slope to other things and in the US. So I think that's partly why this bill is so important, because while other other countries are going backwards, we should be striving to to move forwards. Um, Roe versus Wade was overturned partly through my consultation being 
being open and you can you can see the effect that that had on on people wanting to get in touch and and have their and have their say and I'm really glad that people have people have shared some really harrowing stories with me um about their about their experiences and why they think this legislation's so important I think we need to continue to counter the narrative that that comes from the US and I think that's where I'm quite pleased at the amount of support I've had cross party um in the parliament for this for this proposal it doesn't give like the US two party system it doesn't give um anti anti choice activists a party to hide in for for want of a better phrase it doesn't give them a natural home anywhere across the chamber in in Scotland there's members of every party who have said they'll they'll support this this legislation so that that pleases me quite a lot as well that there is that that progressive want to to protect people's rights um across the chamber so I hope that everybody else takes some comfort in that but I've got absolutely I'm not under any illusion that just because this bill passes doesn't mean we won't see some activity in attempting to breach these zones once the bill comes into comes into effect and how we handle that both in terms of political narrative and the and the practical handling of of those incidents is going to be really important to make sure that safe access zones are all that we want them to be so on on the legislation then um what's the current state of the bill what can you talk us through the kind of parliamentary process and where it's currently at yep so i said in the chamber a couple of weeks ago now that we will have the final proposal lodged before um before summer recess that will allow msps to show their support again um and hope that many many of them will once we come back from a uh, summer recess the final proposal the final legislation will be will be lodged and then it will start the its process through um through the parliament so through stage one where the committee will take evidence there'll be a debate on the the proposal in the chamber stage two which is the committee amendment stage um, and then stage three which is another amendment stage but essentially takes the whole parliament as a committee um, and kind of replicates what happens at stage two just in the chamber and once that happens it will go through the usual process of going for royal assent have its commencement date and we will go from there but the the other thing we do have to keep in mind is there is more than likely as happened with uh, Claire Bailey's bill in Northern Ireland um, that there will probably be a legal challenge which is why we've been so careful up to now to make sure that we're dotting I's crossing T's because the we've shown Claire Bailey in all her glory showed that this can be done in terms of balancing rights so what we will probably be challenged on is process so we've got to be really careful that we make sure we follow all the processes, make sure we're doing everything right, and that this bill isn't knocked back because because of process. So something we're we're very live to, um, and I'm always of the opinion that I'd rather take an extra week to make sure that it was right than than rush it out and and find out down the line that we've we've not done something the way it should have, and it potentially be be an issue. So. Yes, lots of nerves in our office at the moment, making sure that that we've done everything, done everything we possibly can to make sure that it's completely watertight. And so you said earlier that this that the bill's got cross party support. Um, there'll be some people watching will be quite surprised to hear you say that from all parties there's been support. And I wondered if, um, you know, you, I think a lot of people would expect there to be elements in the Conservative Party who would be opposed to this kind of legislation. Um, I think especially, you know, in the current context where the Tories, at least in Westminster, but also increasingly in Holyrood, are kind of pushing culture war issues um, as a seemingly an election strategy that's somehow going to save them from catastrophic defeat at the next election. But um I, I wonder if you could talk about where the Tories are at it. Is there a division within them? Are there likely to be Tories who are opposing this? I think there probably will be, um, but I think that we will be in single digit numbers of MSPs across the chamber who will who will oppose this. And out of 120, you have to exclude the presiding officer. So out of 128, if we're down to eight or nine who don't who don't support this, then to be honest, you'll probably have to stop me doing cartwheels through the chamber, to be quite honest. Um, 
the the Conservatives have surprised me so far, um, and maybe that that needs a wee bit of self reflection <laughs> on me. Um, but there are a couple of them who have told me in the presence of other MSPs that they're going to vote for this. And honestly, I had to pick my jaw up off the table um, because in other issues, they are some of the most conservative and socially um, that I think there, there potentially are in their, in their party. So many of them have expressed support and even before a final proposal or legislation is lodged which is very odd for a for a member's bill we're we're all usually quite cagey about each other's members bills and give the whole oh we'll wait to, to see what comes forward in the detail of the legislation and and all those sorts of things where we had last summer where when the consultation was going on there were a whole of MSPs who just absolutely said yes we need to do this this is the right thing to do I think it's partly because it's quite actually a simple concept um, and a lot of it is about how we deliver it rather than um, whether the concept is is right or wrong, which is probably where the support was maybe easier to, to gather. But certainly every single party has has expressed support for for this. I'm very grateful to them all. Um, and we need to we need to keep that going as we get through the next the next few months and get it through Parliament. Um, so then, finally, in terms of those next few months, how can people support the bill and the efforts to get these buffer zones introduced? I suppose doing all the doing all the usual things, get on Twitter and retweet everything, share your stories with us if if that's something that that you would like to do. More than happy to share my my email address with anyone who would who would like it to share um to share their stories once it does come to um being open for signatures from MSPs and things if people wanted to write to their MSPs to encourage them and check up that they have uh signed the proposal that would be that would be fab and really just expressing how important this is um obviously there's a there's an amendment to the public order bill which is still going, as far as I'm aware, still doing its ping pong stages between the Commons and the Lords. Um, it has an amendment on safe access zones to it, without the the entire problems of the rest of that uh, the rest of that piece of piece of legislation. Um, people expressing their support for safe access zones, wherever you are, is really useful. We'll obviously be looking to um, how the implementation of Claire Bailey's bill happens in in Northern Ireland as well and what we can what we can take from that we're in a slightly different position where Police Scotland have so far been quite supportive rather than PSNI who haven't been um as supportive so I think there are differences there are differences in every place but if if people can just keep amplifying what they think about these sharing their stories and retweeting sharing liking whatever they whatever they see come up give some of the organizations who um who have backed this so far some some love on social media as well because they've had some some horrendous abuse at, at various at various points back off scotland be pass abortion rights scotland and gender all these sorts of people who have been phenomenally supportive um and just make sure that this is this is something that can't be the reproductive rights continue to go forward and can't be rolled back on julian it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much for joining me today thanks so much